Okay, so this is Andy and Willie, and this is Andy's first call, and he's from Windsor, Ontario. And so um, we're talking um, about the super mundane Dhamma, and that basically there are two Buddhisms. There is the Buddhism of the masses, and then there is a hidden deeper teaching of the Buddha, which is actually the Buddha's teaching originally. What had happened over the centuries was is that layers and layers of religion and believers and sometimes even malicious changes to the suttas have occurred to try to turn it into a religion and that they were completely successful at turning Buddhism into a religion, but they weren't completely 100% successful, that the real teachings of the Buddha have survived all of this time. Throughout all of the centuries, the real teachings of the Buddha have never been lost, but they certainly are lost to the West, but not in Asia. And part of the reason that that happened was because whenever Buddhism came to a particular area in Asia, it always came by nobles through nobles and established it in a noble way. That didn't happen in the West. The West Buddhism came by Christians, by translators, by people who came from Oxford and Pali and translated the Pali into English without knowing any of the Pali. They had to do their own dictionaries, their own lexicons, and they also did not know the, the noble Dhamma. And so the English language versions of the suttas uh, are very misleading. You almost have to know how to read them in order to retranslate all of the words that you'll find in the suttas back into something that's actually correct. Now, you've probably heard of the word dukkha. Uh, du yes, yeah. Okay, dukkha and dukkha naroda is in fact the entire teachings of the Buddha. There is nothing other than just that. And yet you will uh, imagine that there are a huge amounts of things that are considered Buddhism, talked about as Buddhism, and yet this is not the teaching of the Buddha. So everything that's not the teaching of the Buddha, including all of the things that the people believed in the time of the Buddha, is not the teaching of the Buddha, but it would be classified as the Buddhist religion. So the actual teachings of the Buddha is very small, but the Buddhist religion is huge. Mm -hmm. And meditation is one of those qualities of um, the ordinary Buddhism, the Buddhism of religion, the Buddhism of the masses. So most people who know that, that Buddhism is associated with meditation, they do not think that it's okay for them to do it or they're not going to get value out of it now. So they would rather make merit or do other things to get a better life so that they can practice later. This is one of the major reasons why I would call the religion of Buddhism a complete failure. And that uh, what happened though is that as Buddhism came to the West, the idea that uh, but everything about Buddhism is meditation then means that now everyone in the West is all interested in meditation, but they don't have the right basis or background for it. So that winds up being with a lot of different systems. Now, one of the things that I find strikingly amazing and amusing is that Zen is very, very similar to the teachings of the Buddha, but it just lacks detail that is there that has been kept in the Theravada. So with Zazen or just sitting is, is the point of coming to the state of nothingness. But the Western mind is missing almost all of the detail out of that, and so they don't know how to just sit. 
Now, strong determination, one of the most important qualities about it was that you were not just sitting. You were sitting in pain. You were sitting in discomfort. Mm -hmm. You were trying to tell yourself and pump yourself up for, for this is a good thing to do. All right. Okay, so basically what the teachings of the Buddha is really about is Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. Your job is to understand what the word Dukkha and Dukkha Naroda means in your life. And when you come to understand that, then you'll come to understand to avoid Dukkha and to seek out uh, the end of suffering, except that the word suffering is actually a very, very unusually bad word. That's possibly the worst word that they ever uh, translated into English. They got that one really, really wrong. Calling it suffering. Because most people will say, oh, I'm not suffering. The suffering is when you're in great pain. But if you understand dukkha in the sense of dukkha and sukha, and because in the Pali there is an opposite. That opposite of dukkha is sukha, and that's also in the Thai language. They have duke and suk, and suk is actually a common word. It's so common that you'll find it in advertisements. And that the word sukha has the quality of pleasure, but it's more... Um, directly involved with satisfaction. All right, so really the right way to look at dukkha is anything that is not satisfaction. If it's not satisfying, then that's dukkha. If it's satisfying, if it's satisfactory, then that is sukkha. All right. So how would you rather live? Would you like to live your life the way that you have, which you're just kind of haphazardly, spottedly just going into dissatisfaction on a regular basis? Or would you like to find a way of looking out for it so that you can avoid it? Of course, the second. All right. So let's go back and just pounce one more time, one more, one more nail in the coffin of your strong determination sitting. I understand. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> because, in fact, strong determination settings are not taking you in the direction of satisfaction. They're taking you in the direction of even more suffering rather than less. So in shorthand, what we've got to do is just that. That's what makes the actual teachings of the Buddha so simple. Now, that uh, uh, one little statement of Dukkha, Dukkha, Naroda can actually be stated in many, many different ways. And it is, in fact, in our culture in many different ways. Goanka uses the term, never mind, start again. But if you think about it, that's the entire teaching of the Buddha. Never mind the suffering, start again correctly. Mm -hmm. Another one would be, don't worry, be happy. Come out of your suffering into joy. Back in the 1950s, there was a lot of music that would recommend that. And yet in modern times, because I think partly it had to do with, um, let us say, changes in the music industry that were associated with the Internet as well as uh, popular street music like rap, gangster rap, uh, heavy metal, and that kind of stuff, has taken the world of music and the world of the young into an even darker place than they were 50, 60, or 70 years ago. So in that regard, things are kind of going backwards because people are not going for joy or going for light. They're not singing songs like, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. No, no, we don't sing songs like that. Nor do we even do James Brown anymore. Do you know James Brown? No, I can't say I do. I feel good. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah. I can do I would now. Okay. Or don't worry, be happy. 
da 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 Bobby McFerrin. So there was a time a lot of happy music, but we don't have happy music anymore. I don't even know how people are going to learn to feel good if they don't have music. Oh, I know. They can go buy something. That's how people get their joy nowadays. In other words, the business community has completely sold the world on your happiness depends upon what you can afford. Well, that's the normal world also, the world of Buddhism, the world of ordinary Buddhism or the Buddhist religion also lives in that world. And so the word super mundane that I used before actually in the Pali is uh, uh, loka ratara, which means above the world or to transcend the world or to come out of the world ways into a more noble, uh, happier way of living. And this is the entire sum teaching of the Buddha. That's all of it. That's the whole thing. Okay. In a nutshell, but let's crack that nut open and see what's in there. The first thing that we find is the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are, the first Noble Truth is Dukkha. But it's not Dukkha in, in a conceptual way, but it's rather Dukkha in an experiential way. In other words, your job is to know when you're in Dukkha. Because if you don't know you're in Dukkha, there's no way out of it. But a secondary part of the job is is to know, and, and in fact, the secondary means that you're getting some skills going, <laughs> is, is that you know in advance that, hey, if I do that, that I'll go into Dukkha. Mm -hmm. So we, in fact, the way that you could talk about it is you learn to recognize that you do not want your feet covered in cow pies. And so you begin to step around them. But heretofore, you, because everybody else has been walking in the cow pies, not watching where they're going, you've gotten that same habit. The entire society, including all of your first grade and second grade teachers, your aunts, your uncles, the preachers, your mom, your dad, your older siblings, everybody just walks around stepping in cow pies of suffering, of dukkha, of dissatisfactoriness. And so you thought all your life, well, that's how things are. I got to go walk in that stuff, too. But you don't have to. Mm -hmm. All you have to do, in fact, is watch where you're going. <laughs> that watching where we're going, then, is a major quality of the teaching of the Buddha, is learn to see what dukkha is. But there's also something else very important, and that is the third noble truth. And that third noble truth is to recognize for sure when you're not in suffering. How are we going to do that? Well, that's a training and that that, in fact, is possibly the best way of looking at what meditation is, is training the mind and to a degree the body to not suffer, to come out of dukkha, to come into a state of satisfaction. And once you come into that state of satisfaction, then your job is, is to maintain that state of satisfaction. And then your job after that is to maintain it again until you get very good at maintaining satisfaction and then you don't, you don't even have the work of trying to maintain it because it's just there naturally. But in the beginning, we have to get ourselves into a state of satisfaction, and that's pretty hard to do unless you know how. Because look at all the stuff that you've been doing in your whole life to gain happiness. Think about the kinds of things that you've been doing in your life to gain happiness. Well, one is you, you did the first grade. Because you knew if you didn't do first grade, that a whole lot of people were going to have a whole lot of unhappiness to pour all over you. Then there was second grade. But by second grade, there's a promise. 
all the promise is is that, hey, if you do this one and two more, then you'll get promoted out of grammar school into middle school. Way! I'm so happy I'm in middle school. But then they do the same thing to you again. And now you're in high school. Yay, I'm in high school. And then they do the same thing again in four-year blocks. And then, yay, I'm out of high school and I'm into college now. And then four years later, yay, I finished college. And look, it's the same trip they played on you starting when you were five years old. And you bought into it every time every kid does. And so you gave up your childhood happiness for the promise of some reward. So the question is, are you going to continue in that way and going from the, the degree to the job to buying a house, to getting a car, to getting a wife, to getting a midlife crisis, getting a big promotion. In that midlife crisis, you got to either buy a Mercedes or a motorcycle, one or the other. And then after that, what is life? Then after that, then you retire. And one of the things that we found for sure, in fact, I've got some stories about it, I'll leave the stories for later, that men generally die right after they retire. Why? Because of two things. One is, is that they don't know how to structure their time. They're not happy at the way that they structure their time, and they've been using their job to structure their time their whole lives. Now they don't know how to structure their time. So they went from a level four, let us say, of, uh, of suffering to a level of seven. In other words, when they retire, now they're out of the loop and they don't have any skills to learn to know how to be retired. And so they die. And then they have the, the, um, the bumper sticker, life's a bitch and then you die. You've seen that bumper sticker, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, maybe not because it was back in the 80s. So life's a bitch and then you die. Is that how you want to live your life? Clearly not, no. Do you want to just live your life like that and add some extra stuff like strong determination sitting? No. <laughs> but I think uh, the really the reason I'm doing this is uh, not necessarily for the satisfaction, not necessarily for the happiness. I just want to see, you know, what the, what the world really looks like, you know? Guess what? You nor no human being, regardless of the state that you ever receive or get into or develop, you will never be able to see actual full reality. Mm -hmm. Not possible. But closer. I can get closer through meditation, yeah? Well, why? Uh, I heard it's something like... Um, Untangling your experiences from each other, untangling like the mess of your experiences, yeah? Okay, but that doesn't sound like, oh, it looks like my camera. Yeah, it looks like it's freezing up a bit. Yeah, I think, yeah, the stream just froze, yeah. Oh, I think, I think it's Amarado, DC, what happened? Were you able to... I think he might need to... Okay. Uh... It's going to come back in a minute. It's starting up again. Oh, okay. Gotcha. It's trying to... Hmm. Let me go and see... Setup. Yeah. Settings. I think we can still hear your voice, though. Yeah, well, let me take one second and I'll do this. Hmm. I see the microphone. For my background, that doesn't help. Ooh, me. All right, I guess you can just con continue on without the video there's sure. one more thing i can try
I mean, what if you try toggling the camera button again, like the the one that's like right next I, to the microphone? I don't have I don't have a camera button. Oh. Uh, do you see anything next to like the red button, like where you hang up? Oh, you mean on the Skype? Yeah, it's like on the on the. On oh, the okay. Now I've turned it off. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. I turn it back on. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> you were right. All <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, backing into Dukkha and Dukkha Naroda, the Buddha then from the Four Noble Truths, um, the Four Noble Truths is that there is suffering, there is a cause to suffering, or let's just say that there is dis, uh, unsatisfactoriness or dissatisfaction. But the cause of all dissatisfaction is within one's own mind, is one's own greed, ill will, and delusion. But there is also a state where you can get into, and people experience this on a regular basis, but they don't notice it, and that is a state that's free from suffering. And so part of your job in meditation is to learn what it's like to be in that third noble truth, to be free from suffering. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa calls this a little Nibbana moment. A little Nibbana moment. In other words, can you go into a state of coolness? Now, this is available to everyone. This is not something that you have to work months and months for. It's something that you should be able to do immediately. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about how to do that. But first, we want to look at, in fact, the Eightfold Noble Path, because it's doing the path that gets us into that state of the Third Noble Truth, that state of satisfaction. So we have to practice that Eightfold Noble Path. But when you're sitting in meditation, because you're sitting, you're not talking, you're not moving, therefore your behavior your action and your um, speech is in fact perfect. And you're not doing anything to make any money, so your livelihood is perfect. Just by going in and sitting down, your that part of the path is perfect. But that's not the part of the path that needs the work. Now, in in the Buddhist religion, they start with the precepts about right behavior and right speech, and they tell that to students from the very beginning in the hope that we can have a decent society. But that decent society is actually based upon mundane things and is not really liberating. And I can see where that uh, the folks that were beginning to build the Buddhist religion, were looking for tools to do it. They took the stuff out of the Eightfold Noble Path and turned them into a set of rules, like Panatipata, Vairamadi, Sakabadam, Samati Ami, Atenadana, Vairamani, Sakabadam, Samati Ami. Have you ever heard of that? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Atenadana, Vairamani means. Um, to not take things that are not given. Musawada is false speech. Uh, Panatipata is not killing. So now you've heard those things before, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. Okay. So these are the points that we call precepts to where when you're sitting in meditation, you don't need precepts because that stuff is perfect. Also, when the mind is noble, when you are free from suffering, your sila then, or your morality then, is also perfect. It's only when we're in a state of dissatisfaction that there is an opportunity to bring, break the rules. In other words, people will be catty on the uh, Reddit or catty with their family because they don't like what was just said, and so they'll send something back but it's always done out of a state of dissatisfaction. For instance, shoplifting, 
at a certain store would be because of whatever reason. And one of the interesting ones is, well, I thought their prices were too high. And so I decided to take it. Okay. So I thought their prices too high. That's actually meaning I'm dissatisfied with their prices. If I were satisfied with their prices, then I wouldn't have any need or reason to take it. Ah, so this is what we're meaning now is, is that the noble truth is truly noble, especially noble in our actions and our speech, naturally. That if we were naturally free from suffering, then we would naturally be really, really well behaved. So now let's look at the part of the path that needs to be worked. The first one is right noble view. Now, one's ordinary right view towards meditation would be that it would be better to meditate than not meditate. Is that correct? I mean, you've got that right view. You're doing those strong determination sittings. Mm -hmm. But as you grow in the Dhamma, your determination, excuse me, your, your, your determination will grow. And it will grow with right noble view as you get a better view your determination will improve and go greatly so that eventually you'll be ready for strong determination cities because you've got that kind of determination but in the beginning you don't so you wind up in pain a lot so let's go back now and look at the four qualities of the eightfold noble path that will help you get into that state. First one is to maintain and improve right view. The second one is the most important of all of the skills to be developed, and that is sati. This is the word that you've heard before in, in modern uh, Western Buddhism called mindfulness. But sati is a whole lot more powerful when you understand it correctly. Because you see, mindfulness means, oh, well, I'm going to be mindful. But sati means something else. It means to remember. For instance, to remember to be mindful. And everything about the practice of the Buddha is going to be based upon to remember to come out of the world that you were in, whether it's uh, uh, the, your own view of the outside world or your own concocted inside world, because they're basically the same thing to come out of that world into the present moment. That's sati. And that uh, um, as we go through it, I'll teach you how that fits into Anapanasati. But the first thing that we want to talk about is the Four Noble Truths and what, what meaning it is. So we've got to learn to remember things. Then the next one is we've got to pr apply right effort. Most people put in either too little or too much. When they put in too little effort, that means, okay, I'm putting in the meditation, and now it's up to the meditation gods to reward me. So they're not putting enough effort in. Or they're putting in too much effort, like in strong determination settings. I can do this. Okay. Got some tightness in there. But there is a very easy way of practicing right um, effort. So right view, right effort, and right sati, or right remembering, runs in circles around each other. These are three things that we need to get started one on, and then very quickly add the fourth, which is right attitude. The attitude that most people have throughout their whole lives, whether they're Buddhist or Western people or Western Buddhists throughout the world, our so human society is based upon every human being being a victim of something. When we're little children, we're victims in the sense we can't even feed ourselves, we can't diaper ourselves, we don't have control over our bowels, and then for many years, all of the big people are a whole lot bigger than we are, stronger than we are, and we are forced to do what we're told to do, whether we like it or not. And they don't teach us how to like things very well. They teach us to do what we're told to do, and whether you like it or not is irrelevant. And so we wind up 
raising our children to be victims. And when the adult comes by, he's going to then raise his family the way that he was raised. And so we perpetuate that victimhood. Now, here's something very funny, and that is, is that people who look like they're on top, they're also victims. An example of it, and it's just a funny example because it's such a big example, and that is Donald Trump. If you'll notice, he plays in all his games throughout all of the time that he's been in public years back. He's always played the victim's position. In other words, they have no right to attack me, but I have a right to attack them. But that no right to attack me, that's the victim's position. And now you can also see that very wealthy people, they wind up being a victim too. Who, what are they a victim of? Well, they're a victim of their own greed, for one thing, by uh, thinking that money is going to make them happy because they got a hit of, of dopamine by getting a large sum of money one time. And so they say, okay, how I can get that feeling again is by going and getting some more money, even if I have to steal it. And so they start amassing wealth and more wealth and more wealth, hurting more and more people that they're taking the money from by not giving them proper salaries, et cetera, like that. Thinking that their happiness depends upon money and they wind up being very miserable. And so they start spending a lot of money, living lavishly, thinking that they're going to feel good, but they don't. They're always dissatisfied. Money will never bring you out of a dissatisfaction. And yet we've been told that. So we have to find a better way of getting into and maintaining a state of satisfaction. Well, part of the way of doing that is by changing our attitude from being a victim of dissatisfaction into being a winner who is satisfied. Do you hear what I just said? I'm talking about just a change of attitude. Just by changing our attitude about life, and that's so slow, but I've seen a lot of people begin to make that change. <laughs> Willie is smiling because he knows, yeah, he went that, through that too. <laughs> that, ch that change of attitude is the major, major improvement in one's life, and that needs to be practiced right from the very beginning. And so now we have these four things working together, right view, right sati, to keep coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back to do this thing. And that is taking the right effort to get ourselves into a state of joy, to get ourselves into a state of happy satisfaction. This is actually right there, buried right into the Four Noble Truths and the Eight Four Noble Path, but people don't get it because they're not looking at it from a noble perspective. They're only looking at it from the ordinary perspective. So this is actually, by practicing the Eight Four Noble Path, we are actually practicing correctly, and that brings us to, that, to the attitude of being a winner, being joyful, not being depressed, not being unsatisfactory, not dwelling in a state of unsatisfactoriness, but instead living our lives in that third noble truth, the state of this is the end of suffering. This is the end of that crap, and I could be happy. So now let's look at that second noble truth for a little while. The second noble truth is actually Loba Moha Dosa in the Pali, but Loba Moha Dosa is actually um, what the Buddha was doing uh, on that very famous night. It wasn't actually just a night. It, t it lasted a while. But he did some deep investigation into the nature of suffering is not caused by gods, it's not caused by weather, it's not caused by fire, it's not caused by somebody telling me what an idiot I am or that I should go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> those things don't make one sad. It's not liking those things. That's what causes uh, suffering, is that we don't like it. Mm -hmm. 
So when the tsunami comes, if we're wise and we can see the water just going rushing right out, we should be rushing in the other direction towards high land because you should figure out that if the ocean is going out, it's going to come back with a vengeance. And so tsunamis, those, those are not uh, suffering. Being ignorant about tsunamis, that's suffering. And a lot of people suffered because they were ignorant of tsunamis. They didn't know what they were. As we're learning more about weather, we don't suffer so much. But that's a clear example right there that tsunamis, acts of God, don't cause suffering. It's each individual causes his own suffering, and in this case, through ignorance, not knowing enough to get out of there. But mostly the suffering comes from liking and not liking. And not liking ignorantly and not liking or liking ignorantly. For instance, if we like like something, something. then we want it. it. I hear an echo. Mm -hmm. Now it's known. if, If I like something and I want it, now that means I want something I don't have. That is one of the classical definitions of dukkha, wanting something that you don't have. Well, that takes an, an amazing change then. Wanting things that we don't have means that whatever I want, I should want it in the sense that I can get it very quickly. For instance, I want to go to the bathroom. I just go to the bathroom. But what if I want to go to the bathroom and go to the bathroom and the bathroom door is locked? Somebody's already in there. Now the suffering starts. Because now I can't have what I want. Okay. So this is pointing to the point that everything about the teaching of the Buddha has to do with what's happening right now rather than what's happening in the future. Because if we want something we can't have or we don't have, then that's going to be taking us into a state of unsatisfactoriness. So we should be wise about what we like and what we don't like. Because if we are ignorant about liking, then we'll want it. An example of that is seeing a pretty girl. If you see that pretty girl and you can say, oh, she's just so beautiful. She's drop dead gorgeous. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I like it, but I don't want it. That's the right way to look. That's that's wisdom. But most guys, they don't. They say, oh, I like that. Oh, I got to have some of that. Oh, And now you hear that longing and lust coming up. So that's when we begin to suffer. And some guys will suffer right down the street. They'll follow her down the road. They can suffer their way right into the meditation hall. In fact, they call this the Vipassana romance. (laughs) Why? Instead of just letting the girl be drop-dead gorgeous sitting right there, we can say, oh, wow, but yeah, I've got a plan. (laughs) (laughs) And now that planning and scheming is taking us out of Vipassana and we're wasting our time there because, well, lust, we know how to do that. We can watch TV and get full of lust. No, in the meditation hall, we want to do something better than wanting things that we can't have. Like what, John, is, go ahead. What about ambitiousness? Like Yes, isn't, isn't that a poison? Why are you ambitious? Uh, to, <laughs> huh? to, uh, to try and uh, get, get to places where you aren't. Like, even in meditation. <laughs> you just said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But certainly even so in... Uh, ambition then is a form of suffering. Isn't then uh, following the Buddhist teachings uh, like uh, also a form of ambition? No. Ambition no, because if you're practicing right, you get what you want right now. You do not sit in the meditation hall for six months or six years waiting for some stupid comma machine to come in and stap you on the uh, the noggin and say, okay, now you're enlightened. Now you can feel happy. That's not going to happen. No, your job is to start feeling happy right now. Mm-hmm. Right now. 
Um, I think this is a good place for me to stop. Um, I think, yeah, I got to go to bed. Willie, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that you came in. We'll talk yeah. about your stuff a little later. No, it was nice to meet you, Andy. Yeah. Yep. I hope to see you next time. Yep. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Yep. Yep. Okay, so ambition is actually a form of suffering when we want things that we can't have right now. So let's work on these four noble truths and this eightfold noble path to find out how we can get what we want right now in order to be satisfied with right now. Because that's the whole point of it. If you could practice something so that you could become satisfied in this present moment, then what else do you want? Let us put it this way. If you were completely satisfied, I'm talking about 100% satisfied, and there is nothing else that you want. And then somebody came by peddling something called enlightenment. And you say, hmm, what's the big deal? No, I'm satisfied. All right. So now let's come and look at someone who is enlightened, but they want to be a little more enlightened. What is that? That means that they're not enlightened enough. They're not satisfied yet. Okay. So this is one of the problems with the word enlightenment in English is because it is confused with what we mean by release from suffering in this present moment. We think of it as a state of being or that it's a station that someone arrives at. But a much better way of looking at it is instantaneous or in this present moment. In other words, you can be enlightened in this moment, completely satisfied, completely full of joy. And then the dog starts barking and you recognize that the cops are coming into the yard. And to now, where is your joy? <laughs> Can you maintain your joy when the cops are not only just coming into the yard, but they're running and they've got their guns out and they're coming in your direction? Now, how do you feel? Ah, it depends upon your level of practice, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now what we're looking at is how can you get yourself into a state of satisfaction and how do you maintain that state of satisfaction? That's basically what the entire practice is all about. And so this is the, the teaching of the Buddha and that he did it um, with this these Four Noble Truths and this framework. But especially when we look at into the second noble truth, we go quite into detail about, well, where is this ignorance? What's it like? What are these feelings? What, what are they like? What are their sources? What are their conditions? What are their causes, et cetera, like that? And so by discussing the second noble truth, we begin to go into things like the five aggregates, the, the four foundations, of mindfulness, the Satipatthana, maybe you've heard of these words before. Down to the full teaching is the Paticca Samuppada, which means dependent origination. Have you heard of Paticca uh-huh. Samuppada, dependent, dependent origination? Okay, that's good. Because most of the information that's floating out there is, let us say, in the Buddhist religion rather than what the Buddha actually taught. What the Buddha actually taught was is that Paticca Samuppada is a map or a method to show the individual just how the mind works. Because if you understand how the mind works, then you can put the mind into any state that you want it to be in. As opposed to the guys who were trying to put their mind in that state by practicing the wrong way, using words like jhanas, I want the first jhana, and then I have a hard time getting it because I'm never satisfied, and satisfaction is one of the items on the list of first jhana. Surprise, surprise. But the guy who does get first jhana, now he wants second jhana. 
The guy who got second jhana, he wants third jhana, but it, uh, many, ti- many times in instances, these things take years and years, partly because the students are practicing wrongly. But if they start practicing correctly so that they really do understand the way that the mind works and that they have the tools and techniques and the skills, then they can go into these stages, into these jhanas. And in fact, in some cases, you'll recognize, oh, I've been there before. I just didn't know it before. That in fact, jhanas are normal human states. An example of something like the first jhana would be being able to read a book from start to finish, watching every word, getting every sentence, knowing every paragraph, getting the point with full comprehension and understanding. People don't read like that. How do they read? Well, they'll read a thought, they'll see something, the first paragraph, then they'll have an idea and think, oh, I know what that means, and it fits into that, and then they start thinking about it, and then now their eyes are moving across the page, but they're thinking about something else. And then they get down to the bottom of the page and they say, wait a minute, I'm not even reading when I thought I was going to read. Mm-hmm. How many times has that ever happened to you? Quite a few, yeah. Yeah, I've, okay. I've some experiences, though, where I've read, uh, particularly when I was younger, where I've read books from uh, in that focused way, you know, before, before all of this, like, technology and stuff, before I had a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, what you're saying is is that you developed a skill, but now you don't even have that skill so much anymore. Uh, I haven't really tested it. Maybe. uh, I'm I'm not sure. Well, how about long articles on the Internet? I've been, I've kind of realized, uh, yeah, it's it's harder to go through these things. But I'm slowly cutting it out, you know, uh, technology and such. Well, um... Development of the ability to pay attention is a skill that can be developed through that. But learning to play a musical instrument Mm -hmm. is learning to pay attention. People who learn martial arts, especially when they get into sparring, because they have to pay attention or they're going to get their face busted. Well, paying attention to what's going on is actually an important quality to add to our practice. But paying attention means that we've got to remember to pay attention. If we don't remember to pay attention, then we're not going to pay attention. That's why it's it's so valuable in, for instance, reading or sparring or playing a musical instrument that if you miss a note, then that means that you're not paying attention. Or even playing skilled um games on the internet or playing games on the internet that that the students in fact learn a very good skill and that is the skill to pay attention to what's happening uh it's also it's kind of a funny thing on the side that uh the the u.s uh military um at one time and i think they're still involved with it is they want to hire the gamers the very best gamers they want to hire in the military. Why? So that they can operate their drones. Why? Because they need to pay attention to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So this whole quality of paying attention has to do with the, the here now. And it also has a lot to do with being in our senses, the sense organs like the eye, the ear, the touch, the taste, these things are in the present moment. But most of the time we spend not in those senses, but we spend it in the mind sense, in the think of, in the thoughts that we have, the spinning of the mind, the going around of the mind. So what the beginning meditator has got to do is build this sati to remember to come back to the object of meditation. Now, the Buddha recommend the breathing. Breathing is your object of meditation. That's got a very good reason for that. And that is most of the time, people are not breathing enough. The breath require, or let us say that the brain requires a lot 
It requires quite a lot of energy, quite a lot of blood, quite a lot of blood sugar, quite a lot of oxygen. And that if the brain is not getting enough, then it shuts down certain aspects. And that the thing that is rarely shut down or in fact never shut down is what we call the anterior cortex, which is a part of the brain in the back. And that anterior cortex is also referred to as the reptilian brain. And some of my students have started to call it uh, yeah, the lizard brain. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think about an alligator or a lizard, everything that an alligator or a lizard can do that you can do, that stuff that you can do is done by the same part of the brain that the lizard has. The ability to walk. The ability to see. The ability to open the mouth and close the mouth and chew food and digest food and have the heart beating and the breathing. And all of that's controlled by the reptilian brain. Then we have another part of the brain that we use a lot, and that is the thinking part of the brain. That's what we would call the mammalian part of the brain, the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. The ability to form concepts and ideas and see things in a... um, uh, a mental image kind of a way or seeing them in a verbal kind of a way, telling ourselves stories, etc. And then the, the important point then is, is that this is the part of the brain that only humans have is this frontal cortex. And it's the one that takes the most amount of, of um, power. And what is that part of the brain? Is that part of the brain which gives us, let us say, the ability to connect dots, the ability to look and see what's happening. This would be called wisdom. But most of the time, most of the people spend their time in feelings or in thought rather than in investigation. So the word mindfulness means to be mindful, means to be in that frontal cortex to watch what's going on to see what's going on clearly so our breathing is going to be used primarily to make sure that that frontal cortex is functioning correctly by giving the body enough oxygen this is why anapanasati and pranayana breathing that the yogi's doing is in fact the same thing or very similar you can you can because of the way it's practiced you can see differences but the outcome and the purpose are the same and that is to oxygenate the body there's many different ways that you can do that but the long slow deep breath is the one that the buddha recommends and that's something like this To make sure that you're getting a lot of oxygen, you want to take a really good deep breath. And that out breath is going to throw a lot of other stuff out of the body besides just carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide itself is coming from amino acids. That in fact, acid, the reason that the the blood gets acidic is because of the carbon dioxide that's in there. And so it doesn't matter about how much oxygen, it's the carbon dioxide level. So it's the interchange and getting out the carbon dioxide and all of the other amino acids that are that are that are small to get them out of the body. An example of that would be um, adrenaline. Because people have adrenaline attacks on a regular basis. They call them panic attacks. They can have also anxiety um, the feeling that I've got to go do something. This is set up by uh, adrenaline, but adrenaline will break down into its constituent components and then be exhaled through the, through the breathing. This is one of the reasons why they tell people who are, who are angry to settle down, take a few deep breaths. Why? Because those deep breaths actually do help regulate the blood. And so this is step one of Anapanasati. That's the important point. The first thing on the list that the Buddha has is breathing. But we have to remember to breathe. So sati comes in. Okay. So now let me give you the full sequence in this way. Imagine that you're sitting there and you, uh, the mind has wandered away. 
The mind is wandered away because that's the normal state to this end. It's wandering all the time. But we're not there for it. So what happens now is sati. Oh, I was going to watch my breath. And here I am not watching my breath. I am letting the mind just wander away. So that's sati. That's the first thing that comes in. This is actually also step nine, and I use the word step only in the sense of dancing, not in marching. When you say step, it doesn't mean you go step one, step two, step three, step four. Sometimes in ballet, you step from, you jump from step one to step 16, and you're flying through the air. Okay, so this is the way that we want to look at it, is, is that the first thing that happens is sati, which is step nine of Anapanasati, to experience the mind, in this case, experience that the mind has wandered away. The next thing is we're going to have right effort. What is right effort? The joyful effort. Because most students, when they see that the mind has wandered away, they'll say, oh, no, monkey mind. Oh, no, this is hard work. Oh, no, maybe I'm not practicing right. Oh, no, I'm just going to be really determined. I'm going to make it work. Okay, so these are all the things that people are doing, none of which are useful. They either don't work hard enough or they work too hard. If they work too hard, they'll give themselves tension in the neck, even headaches. Many different things that can happen by working too hard. And that seems to be the way that you started out. So we need to back off a little bit with the effort and, and make a change to it. Now, that right effort that we're talking about fits in perfectly well with step 10 of Anapanasati. And again, it's not a step. It just happens to be listed that way. But Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about uh, this step 10, which is gladdening the mind, is one of the first things that you have to do. As soon as you recognize that the mind has wandered away, somebody's saying he's trying to call, but he couldn't. Never mind. Uh, when the mind is wandered away, the first thing that we've got to do is, is to remember that it's wandered away. When it is, then we need to get it on to the breath, but we need to do it in a way that's going to take us towards satisfaction. Mm-hmm. The way that I recommend this would be step 10, would be talking about it from the position of, aha, I caught you. Because, aha, I caught you, automatically puts you in the winner's position. I'm the, I'm the boss here, and I see you. I see you, wandering mind, wandering away. That's basically what it is, is that it's the frontal cortex having a conversation now with the, uh, uh, the reptilian brain, the middle cortex, saying, aha, I can see you there. You're, you were supposed to be watching your breath, and you're not. <laughs> okay. But this is also in the direction of joy. Aha, I caught you. Now is taking us into the gladdening of the mind. Uh, Bhante Bila Maramsi talks about puppies. To think about puppies. Do whatever it takes to get your mind gladdened. One of the ways that an experienced meditator would do if he is doing a strong determination sitting, was, aha, I see you, Mr. Payne. Aha, I can see you. And you're not the boss of me. I'm the boss here. Mm-hmm. Let me take a look at you. I'm going to measure you. I'm going to figure you out. And then I'm going to ignore you completely because I've got a really strong mind here and you're just a little old pain. Now, you've never had that kind of thought before. Not really, no. No, in fact, you've become a victim to that pain. Saying, well, if I put up with it long enough, I'll get some value out of it. Is that how you've been practicing? I've, tr- I've been trying to, like, focus on it and see if, well, like, uh, if it'll dissipate or something, yeah. All right. Well, there's no reason to put yourself into any pain at all. Mm-hmm. What we need to do is to work with whatever pain is going to be there on its own without bringing it up. So that we can bring uh, work, let us say that it's easier to play with little toys than it is to play with really big ones. For instance, a four-year-old boy who's got a little Tonka truck, he can go that thing in and out, back and forth, rum, 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 rum. But if you give that child a real Tonka truck, Mm -hmm. 
he won't even be able to get into it. <laughs> right? So think of that big Tonka truck that that child can't get into is the way you're practicing strong determination. But if you practice correctly, someday you'll be able to get into that truck and drive because you're big enough and strong enough and tough enough and you know how to do it. Okay, so let's go back to, well, what are we wanting to practice that's useful, valuable, and wholesome right from the very beginning and good right along the way? The answer is, is that let's not do anything that's going to cause pain. And in fact, if we've been sitting for a while and pains come up, it might be a good idea to mindfully stand up to leave the pain and then mindfully sit back down. That's a better thing to do. Don't give yourself pain. Pain you already have. In fact, dukkha is always a mental thing anyway. It's never physical. So there's no reason to give yourself physical pain in order to deal with a mental issue. Makes no sense at all. But what does make sense is how can you get yourself into a great deal of satisfaction? Well, the answer to that is with right, noble um, attitude, we can take on the attitude of a winner. I can do this. I'm strong enough to handle this. And then we come to the position eventually, which can be the first few weeks, that no matter how obstructed the mind gets, which means no matter how many um, thoughts that I have or whether it's the same thought that keeps coming back over and over and over again, or when I just cleared it out and now it's back again. But it doesn't matter because that's the way that the mind works. The question is, is can we make the statement no matter how many times it comes back, I'm going to throw it back out again. No matter what happens in the mind, I'm the champion here. I can always bring my mind back to the present moment. I do not have to let it be lost in thought. I can be here now. This is the first knowledge that is noble, super mundane, and a factor of the path, is to tell oneself, I can come out of my pain, suffering, and sorrow. I can come out of my hallucinations. I can come out of my greed, my wants. I can let go of the things that I don't have that I want. And I can come to this present moment and be happy right here, right now. I can come out of the past. I can come out of the future. And I can come to this state right now and be happy and content right now. And you'll have to learn to do that over and over and over and over again. Why? Because that state that you just gave yourself, that state of satisfaction is both weak and also short timed. And so your job now is to develop it as a skill so that you become more and more satisfied, deeper satisfied in the sense that it's more lasting. It gets a base to it so that you can maintain that state of satisfaction so that when thoughts or feelings arise that are going to pull you out of that state of satisfaction, you're a little bit slower to go. You don't just jump on whatever Duke of bandwagon that you've been jumping on your whole life. You'll say, wait a minute, maybe not. Maybe I would rather stay satisfied than start thinking about the argument I had with Aunt Susie. Mm -hmm. Or thinking about that bill that I've got to pay. Nope, I'm not going to think about any of that stuff. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to enjoy the touch of the cloth. I'm going to be here and enjoy my breathing. I'm going to be here and enjoy the fact that I can be here now. That I'm strong, I'm tough, I can remember. And so now we're developing these skills of the Eightfold Noble Path. And we're also developing the skills of, of Anapanasati. They work together. That in Anapanasati, you can't practice it without the Eightfold Noble Path. In fact, I don't think anybody can do anything much with the eight, without the Eightfold Noble Path. Or let us say without the uh, aspects of the, the path, but they don't do them in a noble way. 
but by practicing in this way, always to bring yourself to the here now, that's what makes them noble. So noble sati means I'm going to remember to be here now. Right effort is, noble right effort is, I'm going to take the effort that it takes to be feeling really good right now. And then we have right attitude. And that is, wow, I am the winner here. I can handle this no matter what. I can come out of that uh, suffering and unhappiness and be a champion, be a winner, be on top. A way of saying it is, is that everyone is an emperor of their own pile of dirt. The question is, are you going to be buried under that pile of dirt? Are you going to be struggling half buried in it? Or are you going to be sitting on top of it, on top of the world, on top of your own world of your own pile of, of suffering? Are you going to become your own emperor? This is why the teachings of the Buddha not the Buddhist religion, but the teachings of the Buddha is good in the beginning because it brings you to this state of satisfaction immediately. Your choice. The choice is yours. Are you going to be kept in the old way, the old patterns, the old ways of doing things, or are you going to come out of it and come into a state of satisfaction and joy? Your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one thing I've been... Uh... I've been wondering, or uh, so I'm not necessarily concerned with uh, satisfaction through meditation. Uh, like it doesn't really matter to me too much whether, uh, or like I feel quite satisfied, not perfectly satisfied, but quite satisfied so far. I was just more interested in the kind of weird conscious states that uh, meditation can bring up. In what? In the weird conscious states like the states of the mind. Okay. So, like, I'm more interested in, in that kind of stuff, not necessarily, you know, pure satisfaction or pure, uh, you know, the, the cessation of... Uh... Okay, let us say, all right, whatever your state that you're thinking about, a state of consciousness. If mm -hmm. you're in that state of consciousness, would you be satisfied there? Uh, see, for me, it's a, it's not about that. Like, uh, I'm just I want to experience these things, you know, uh, instead of uh, instead of going just towards a happiness, towards satisfaction. Uh, I just want to see kind of what uh, like the the weird places that can be with meditation, if that makes any sense. Okay. Well, you don't have those states, is that right? Uh, that yeah. Okay. Do you recognize that that's a desire? That that's yes. a want, yes. that you're wanting something that you don't have. And, and so that in itself is a state of suffering. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like a state of suffering. Like, uh, it's, it is a want for sure. But, uh, like, I don't, I don't feel unsatisfied from it. I want to uh, pursue it. Does that make kind of uh, sense? Um, yes, and I'm I'm not sure exactly what to say to you about it. Let me think about this. First off, what you're doing is very very typical for Westerners. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, very very typical. And that so long as you're wanting something that you don't have, air how subtle that wanting is, it is still going to be a level of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so long as you are in a state of dissatisfaction because you want it, that means that you're going to continuously perpetuate your inability to gain the very states that you want. In other words, you're standing on the ground saying, I want up there on the porch and there's only 10 steps and I refuse to take that first step because I want to make my first step to go all the way to the porch. I'm not going to take step one, step two, step three, step four. I'm not going to do that. 
I'm, I want to go from the ground zero that I'm at all the way up to these states that you're thinking about. Mm-hmm. You're not going to do it. Because the very first thing that you're going to requ- that's going to be required is you're going to have to be in a state of satisfaction. Then, in fact, satisfaction is the first jhana. So whatever consciousness states that you're talking about, more than likely they have something to do with jhana. Uh, I think, no, it's not necessarily jhana. I'm, uh, I'm thinking more of no self or uh, like I heard you can remove your kind of your sense of self. That's exactly what we just did, though. If you're in a state of satisfaction, you're out of yourself right then. When you're in a state of wanting something, like some special state, now you're in suffering again. That's the self that wants it. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad that you asked or that you mentioned that. Yes, no self. You can have that immediately. And in fact, everybody has it. From time to time, they're either in self or they're they're not in self. Selfishness comes up when there is something that we don't like or that we're wanting something. And so, for instance, your brother comes and asks you for $500. Are you going to give it to him? Uh, Depends on the uh, circumstances. Uh, Okay. Uh, All right. But here's the here's the point. If you don't give it to him, that's because you want to keep it. Mm -hmm. All right. So that means that both of you are in a state of suffering. But if you give him the five hundred dollars, that means that you were not attached to the five hundred dollars. You can feel generous and he's going to really like that. So if you give him the five hundred dollars, there's no suffering. If you keep the five hundred dollars, then and you just said, well, it depends. I mean, I'm going to set conditions on this, mm-hmm. All right? Okay. So let's begin to understand what we mean by satisfaction and dissatisfaction, because that's that, in fact, will be the the primary thing that a student needs to learn, because we do not understand the nature of of dukkha that we don't understand that very subtle little layers of of suffering or dukkha in the sense of oh well i want to be in a state of and it is an abstract state and that what that abstract state means is that basically you've got a kind of an idea of what it is but you don't know how to get there but you think that when you do get there that you'll recognize it oh that's what i was looking for And you may not. That may never happen. Uh, Coming back to the uh, the jhanas, uh, I think I have experienced like the first one, maybe uh, a few weeks, few weeks back or something like that. Uh, If you practice correctly, you can go into it at any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've kind of. um, Right, right. No, no, I'm not talking about philosophically. I'm talking about what I've told you today. You should have been already in first jhana. Right here talking to me. Oh, the um, the the folk the analogy with uh, focusing on a book. uh... No, in the full analogy that not only are you paying attention to me, but you completely satisfied that you're deep breathing, that you are constantly mindful and you're making sure Okay, so that would be the first jhana, the five uh, factors of jhana. In fact, the only one that we haven't talked about specifically is the word pity, Uh, which is a a jhana factor. I've heard of that, yeah. What's the, uh, like, English translation? Guess what? There's not one. No good one? There's not a good one. The worst one, or let us say the common one, is the word rapture. But only Christians use that word. Other words that are used is sometimes absorption. But really, pity has to do um, kind of with elation. You could think about it um, uh, as dopamine. And sukha would then be serotonin. And that that people are actually out looking for dopamine and serotonin 
all the time. That's why you go to work. Mm. Because if you don't go to work, then you're going to have adrenaline and uh, uh, cortisone instead when you get fired. Right. And so we seek these things and we want to avoid those things, but we wind up in these things and never get this. Why is that? Just because of the way that we were trained as children. And so this this rapture or pity, a better way of looking at it, you could use the word winner or champion. You can you can go to it with the concept of aha, I caught you. You can come to it with the uh, with the point of um, complete success. That in fact, the word success would be the word that I would use for pity, and then satisfaction would be the word that I would use for sukha, though it's normally translated as pleasure. But sukha dukkha, so if dukkha is dissatisfaction, then sukha would be satisfaction. Satisfaction and um, success. And what are we successful at? Well, the removal of the hindrances, to have the mind free from all the kinds of thoughts that are not associated with the present moment. And so when we're having thoughts of only this present moment, and we're free from the past, free from the future, free from restlessness, free from desire, free from worry, free from doubt. These are the hindrances that keep us out of this present moment. So when we are free from those things, then you should feel like a champion because you have just made yourself free from them. So rapture and seclusion, or let us say rapture and sukha, born of seclusion. That born of seclusion means the joy that it is is to have a mind that is free from hindrances, free from suffering. So this is first jhana. It can be happened when people know what it actually is. You can work yourself up to into it in a matter of minutes by doing some deep breathing, by focusing on I'm a winner. By focusing on, I can do this. By focusing on, this is suffering. This is the end of suffering. This is what it's like to be free from suffering. This is what causes suffering. And this is what I've been doing to get myself out of suffering. All of that can be thought of and worked with in this present moment. And this should be able to then develop some new skills. The new skills would be the skill of sati, the skill of right effort. So the things become very easy for you. Right attitude. The attitude of a winner, not being a victim. So the victim is the one who dreams of special high states. But the winner is someone who is very, very completely satisfied whether he has any particular state or not. However, by being in a state of being a winner and and completely satisfied is a state that the victim is not in because mm-hmm. he's in the state of desiring some sort of magical state that he thinks that he's in or wants to get into. Almost always that's associated with jhanas. Those are the things that people want when you talk about a state of mind, because of no self is not a state of mind. But what is it's, it? Then? It's a state of non-clinging. What about, this, but want, wanting uh, a particular mental state, that's clinging. Mm-hmm. And so there's going to be selfishness there. So simply by not wanting that state, that's going to be in no self. Wanting that state is going to be in a state of selfishness. What about um, states where uh, where you're kind of um, where you're not aware that you're like existing or some something like that, something along those lines? States where. Um, states where you're kind of disassociated from 
your body or something like that. Or your mind. Okay. Why would you want that? Uh, I want to know like what it feels like because, um, yeah, mainly, mainly I would want to know. So long as you want that, you can't yes, have it. I can't have it. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So long as you want those things, you can't have them. But if you practice correctly through satisfaction, then you can go deeper easily. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, being disassociated with the body, you do that every night when you're asleep. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what's the big deal? Uh, but you're not conscious. You're not conscious when you're uh, when that's no. Nope. But if you're if you're out of the body, then you're not conscious of the body. So I don't get what you're talking about yet. Oh, and yeah. I, and I know in a way I'm playing with your mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So okay, I understand what you're saying. I understand. In yeah. other words, if you can't get into first jhana, then <laughs> how do you expect to get into fourth jhana? If that's your goal. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that what it's called? The fourth jhana? Well, the fourth jhana, basically the first jhana is that you get all the jhana factors together, which is pity, sukha, and the exclusion of the nivarana, the hindrances, with a mind that's fit for work because it's oxygenated. And the mind is fit for work then has the ability to apply the mind to where you want it to be applied to and to keep it there, sustain it. This is the first jhana. If you're not able to apply the mind to something and keep it there, then you're not going to be able to progress. If you don't have sukha from the beginning, if you don't have rapture of the first jhana, then you're not going to be able to deal with or maintain or grasp or get the rap, uh, the rapture that you're supposedly going to man- manifest in a big way in second jhana. You got to start with the first jhana. Those are the that that's the first step. And here you are dreaming of the porch mm-hmm. instead of taking one step at a time and enjoying the practice. Okay. Yeah. So what is um what what would you recommend that for the for the practice? Pardon? I'm planning to uh to do something now, right? Uh for a little bit. So what would you I guess recommend the next steps? I you... would recommend first off to develop sati to remember. Mm-hmm. I would also develop right at a uh, right effort. Mm-hmm. In the sense of, aha, I can do this. To recommend also to start breathing deeply when you remember to. Whenever sati arises, take some deep breaths. Come to a state of satisfaction through gladdening the mind. Oh, I can do this. Aha, I caught you. I am a champion at this. I can do this over and over again. All right? Because the normal mind is in a state of suffering. And it has been in the habit of that state of dukkha your whole life. So that's your main habit. We've got to break that habit by creating a new habit. The habit of being joyful. The habit of being satisfied. The habit of feeling secure and safe. Think about these four words now. Success, satisfaction that would lead to contentment, safety and security. Basically, what that means is the safety and security means that you've got no fear. You have no anxiety in this particular moment. And so the chemicals that the brain is putting out would be dopamine and serotonin, and it's not putting out adrenaline. It's not putting out cortisol. So now we've got a, the, the blood is beginning to get purified in a way. So by taking the deep breath and, and going with the, uh, with the quality of gladdening the mind, I can do this. I'm a champion. 
Then when you breathe deeply and get the body oxygenated, then the sense of the feeling of being a champion will come. It's a skill to be developed. And so when you begin to feel like you're successful, that you're on top of the world, that you could do this, that you can control your own mind, then that leads to success. And that leads to then satisfaction. This is sukha that is um, preceded by rapture or pity, which is that high point. Mm. It's like winning a gold medal. How does someone feel when they win a gold medal? After they've been going through the qualifications and learning how to race and getting on the team, and then finally they're in that 100-yard dash, and he's right there at the goal line, and he's won that race. How does he feel? Uh, Satisfied, yeah. Huh? Total satisfaction. Okay. You develop that for yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't have to do with gold medals. It has to do with a mental attitude. The guy who won the gold medal, he needed proof that he could win that uh, 100-yard dash against everybody else in the world in order for him to feel good. You do not need such high standards of proof. You don't need that gold medal to be happy. You don't need that gold medal to be a champion. You can feel being a champion just by sitting on the cushion and breathing in and breathing out and feeling really good about yourself with thoughts like, oh, this is wonderful. Oh, what a beautiful day. Everything is going my way. This is the kinds of things that you need to do to get into first jhana. When you're in first jhana, there is no self because the self comes from the suffering. You'll see that when we talk about Paticca Samuppada, that the birth of the self rises to dukkha. This is what birth of is all about. Birth guarantees death. And in that one-two punch, if something is born, it's going to die. That's true. I cannot think of anything that that's not true about. Every human being that's ever been born is either already dead or will be within a few years, a hundred or so. That just happens. Mm -hmm. Everybody dies. All right. Well, guess what? That also can be understood philosophically that when I have the concept of a me, then that concept of a me is because I'm trying to protect me because there's some sort of danger or dissatisfaction. The dukkha is already there for the self. So when the self arises, it becomes now the the vehicle for the suffering. So if you're in a state of not suffering, if you can say, wow, you know, things are really nice right now. And you're not at the right. This is this. This is the third noble truth. This is really ah. This is nibbana. I feel really cool. That state, no self. But hmm, maybe I could get that state if I think you know I'm practicing meditation. I'm doing strong determination sitting so that I can get something. Well, that's the state of dissatisfaction. That's the state of suffering. So how can practicing and staying in a state of suffering get you to a state of not suffering, as opposed to practicing directly to come out of the suffering, recognizing that you're in it and keep coming back out and getting into a state of satisfaction over and over and over again, that's most likely going to take you in the right direction. Okay. But just allow it that, oh, that's the wisdom. We're going in the right direction. But if I start lusting for whatever is out there in that right direction, now I'm not going in the right direction anymore. I have to be comfortable and, and content and happy with that I'm going in the right direction because I can see it. And that's all that I need right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. This present moment. 
Can you feel good, content, and happy in this present moment? So that's the whole teaching of the Buddha, in short. And all of that stuff about magic area, fairy lands, and mystical places of the mind, and all of that, that's part of the Buddhist religion. That's not part of the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha teaches only dukkha, dukkha naroda, which means get yourself into a state of immense satisfaction and stay there. And in that state, all mental states will become available. But wanting those states makes it not available. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why things are upside down, that, that the, the, this practice is not the same as what they teach you in school. Oh, if you do this, you'll get that. In this case, if you do this, you'll never get that. You got to stop doing this stuff and then that will happen. To the right effort. To the right effort, right. And the right effort is to stop doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Like stop thinking about Aunt Susie. Stop thinking about, I want this mystical state and start thinking about, wow, this is really nice right now. I really like this. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll try it now. Yeah. All right. So, are you going to call back? Uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, next week. Okay. Up to you. Just okay. trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. So go practice in, and if you have any questions, you can call any time. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Then. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll see you then. Okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye, Andy. See ya.